Um, well, uh, I think we can now move on. I think many of these issues we uh, will be also discussed during our final um, discussion after the presentation. So now we move to the next uh, presenter, who actually I just see now on my <laughs> on my screen, uh, Paul uh, Preisner, uh, who is actually uh, an architect. Uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, based in Chicago uh, at the moment, where he's also uh, teaching uh, uh, and uh, he has uh, his own uh, practice. Um, and uh, uh, Paul actually, uh, uh, together with Paul Andersen, uh, Andersen Prisoner, uh, a very interesting practice, uh, which actually uh, has an interest for uh, what they said, the, 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 the boring uh, the, the boring things, uh, <laughs> let's say, or, or things that are not supposed to be ex exciting. Uh, and I think is within this uh, uh, sensibility that uh, they, uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, became very interested in the balloon frame, uh, which is actually one of the most ubiquitous uh, let's say, uh, uh, building technique uh, in, the, in the US. And uh, right now he's developing uh, uh, actually a research that uh, uh, it will be presented in the, uh, uh, the Venice Biennale in the United States, uh, in the pavilion of the United States. Um, so we're very much looking forward. Uh, this is of course the result of this research, but in, in the meantime, Paul will present us uh, perhaps uh, this uh, this body of work on the on the balloon frame and I'm very much looking forward to, especially because the title is very is very promising the American superficial uh, so uh, Paul uh, thanks for being with us uh, and the virtual floor is yours thank thank you very much for having me um, I'm excited to present uh, this so I think I can share my screen yes right? okay so let's do that. I think we have that. So um, I, I guess just to, to, to supplement, I think the, the, the kind of accurate background. So I'm, I'm Paul Preisner. So I have my own practice here in Chicago. Current, currently, I now live in Oak Park, uh, a suburb of Chicago. Uh, and I collaborate rather frequently with Paul Anderson, uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Illinois, and, and also who, uh, in, but he lives in Denver, Colorado with his own practice. Um, but we have come together since about, I think, 2014 to kind of work on ex exhibition projects together, starting with the, uh, the Biennales of America in Denver and then working together uh, with projects for the Chicago Architecture Biennale. Um, and through the working, which started rather, I guess, just intuitively, you know, the, our first project dealt with uh, prefabricated steel. Our next project dealt with uh, large chunks of geofoam that they use to uh, build up highway embankments and reduce the weight of uh, big mounds of dirt on parking garages and things like that. Uh, and to kind of start producing architecture out of these more uh, anonymous forms of material that are used. So uh, we use these kind of glazed structural tiles uh, for an installation we did at the Chicago Architecture Biennale, which are like, I guess most of the things that we've been interested in, ubiquitous in that in America, they're kind of everywhere in swimming pools and high schools, uh, utterly unglamorous um, and kind of without any kind of, I don't know, general general interest or something. And so it was always kind of our, uh, you know, our, our kind of proposal that we should focus on the things uh, that are decidedly normal uh, and, and maybe even kind of er normal uh, and to, to, to make normal things weird instead of trying to make weird things normal, right? Like a kind of anti-spectacular uh, anti work, which, which led us to just kind of figuring out, you know, uh, what we were interested in next. And there was a kind of biannual cycle of the pavilions for the Venice Architecture Biennale. And, and we thought we were both working on single family residential homes at the time, both were being built out of wood frame construction, uh, ki kind of almost without thought. It was just how you do things in the US when you do a house. And it seemed like a topic that we thought might, might really be uh, worth looking at 
with a little bit more uh, humor and, and thoughtfulness or something. So we kind of made a pavilion pitch uh, and presented it to the Department of State on American framing with the idea to kind of focus on the probably the, the single, and I'll kind of explain through the lecture why, but like one of maybe the dumbest forms of construction that has ever been created. And through that kind of utter awfulness of a system uh, has allowed it, along with some other kind of contextual things to kind of dominate the American landscape and be responsible for easily the majority of, of square footage of building constructed. Um, and, and so I guess what I wanted to do today, the presentation is going to be kind of both on that, uh, but not just a kind of sterile um, look at the history of it, but because I think one of the reasons it both came about uh, is that it's a, a kind of very American form of, I guess, practice in the sense that it really uh, kind of embodies a lot of societal and kind of cultural tropes and, and maybe attitudes that the, the kind of American population has with being bored with tradition, kind of uh, distrustful of history, kind of uh, annoyed with expertise and things like that uh, as, as a kind of way of working. And you see that kind of throughout artistic and creative practices within, within American culture. And, and this one is maybe no less. Uh, but its origins, like also almost everything American, kind of come from both a, a kind of uh, weird, sublime attraction to the bucolic and a kind of a lot of uh, lifting from Europe and then uh, finding ways to make it cheaper and, and dumber. So some of these slides, I don't really quite know the origin. This was just a kind of uh, old etching from some Irish textbook. Um, but, but you know, we're, we're all kind of familiar with the kind of domestic dreams of architecture as a kind of place where you're, you're living within the trees. Uh, Albert Durer even kind of drew, you can see a little hammer uh, in this etching he did Melancholia in 1512. So I think like kind of, kind of prefiguring uh, the importance of that particular tool. Um, but the, the technique of American framing really kind of came from something, you know, much, much more developed already kind of within Northern Europe, kind of within Scandinavia, um, which was hardwood kind of construction, right? Heavy timber kind of construction, half, half, half timber framing uh, and, and the like. And it kind of moved through the American uh, colonies uh, and then kind of settled within the American Midwest with you know, our kind of Amish and Mennonite communities uh, with these kind of communal barn, barn buildings out of, out of heavy timber construction, um, you know, more, more people than building um, in that sense. But what seemed to have happened is uh, around the early part of the 19th century, uh, there, there were a number of kind of, I guess, both cultural and technological things that happened that really kind of produced this moment within architecture for the US. Uh, one was the kind of arrival of a figure, George Washington Snow within Chicago. Uh, he, I think, arrived in 1829. You know, the, the records are always a little bit um, odd, but uh, at this time, Chicago had maybe 250 inhabitants or something, and it was largely just a kind of fort and, and a few things. Um, and he sold wood and, and lumber. Uh, and it was kind of around the moment that uh, lumber started to get standardized within the U.S. a little bit. So it wasn't such a kind of uh, uh, individual part. Um, but the, the story goes um, that the very first uh, softwood construction kind of balloon frame building uh, is by George Washington Snow. And it was a warehouse for his lumber distribution on the Chicago River that he built in, in 1832, um, 1832, 1833. There's, there's utterly zero evidence that this is true. Um, and, and it seems that it's the kind of predominant story as to where softwood or where American framing kind of started. Uh, largely attributed to a, a kind of two single sentences within Gideon's Space, Time, and Architecture, where he, without referencing anything, uh, kind of makes this claim. And, and it's kind of just, you know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Uh, there's, there's never been any drawings of the warehouse. There's never been any 
etchings of it. We've looked through lots of drawings and paintings of Chicago at the time uh, and, and can't, can't find anything that even shows a warehouse where it was supposed to be. Uh, but we did locate where it presumably was uh, at the kind of mouth of the Chicago River in Lake Michigan. Um, and there is a, a dot where it was supposed to have been. So supposedly that was that was the phase one. But the kind of more, more documented origin uh, was by another carpenter named Augustine Taylor, uh, who in 1833 built the balloon frame St. Mary's Church, which is here, which is on Wolf Point. Uh, and it was called balloon framing because when he was constructing it with some carpenters and just using really crummy nails and these really thin pieces of wood uh, to hold it up. It, it was kind of derided as uh, unsturdy and so light and flimsy that it would it would blow away in the wind like a balloon. Um, and, and so it wasn't a very regarded form of, of construction for a while. And in fact, uh, you know, it, it, because of its lightness and because of its cheapness and because of its kind of crudity, uh, and there's even a kind of funny anecdote, none of, of any any kind of photos to stow it, but there was a windstorm somewhere in Minnesota um, at one point and a wood framed house literally like was blown off its foundations uh, and rolled down the hill in the wind, but it didn't break at all, right? It just rolled down like a rock. So um, uh, the same kind of you know ch cheapness of wood frame it, uh, proliferated in Chicago, and it's why Chicago kind of burnt down. Um, but but then we started using wood right again to make coffee shops um, in the fire. So the the things about I guess wood framing that are kind of were interesting to, to us uh, and what made it really useful is uh, as kind of I guess an investigative type um, is one that it uses softwood, right? It's not, it's not heavy timber, it's not hardwood. Uh, it uses a kind of wood that isn't very useful for, for much else. It splinters easy, it's very tough to kind of anchor into. Uh, but for the same reason, it's like, it's very easy to run through mills uh, and you can produce it, the kind of pieces at a much faster rate than you could with hardwood. Uh, it also grows faster, uh, you know, and in the Midwest, uh, softwood was just super plentiful with all the, the, the pine we had. Uh, and then the details are few, I guess. So unlike uh, heavy timber construction or stone or masonry, you know, all, all the other kind of predominant forms of architectural build at the time, uh, those required educated, skilled labor, uh, guild work, lots of people, because when you're lifting heavy timber, it's, you know, requires a lot. Uh, and softwood construction needed, needed none of that. It had only a few details. It was enormously redundant because the wood was so terrible and unreliable as a method. Um, there's so much redundancy built into the few techniques that you can kind of do whatever you want and it works. Uh, it's also so light, you need little, little team, like smaller teams can actually produce these things. So you don't need lots of horses at the time, you know, huge crews. Uh, you could just bring things to site with one, with one horse. Um, and you could build it without knowing very much at all. And it also kind of was around the time of, of the, um, you know, so, so details are pretty repetitive and simple. Uh, and then there was advancement in nails where we went from nails that were kind of cast in a very long, lengthy way to uh, nails that were just mass produced. Um, so really the kind of like cheapness of the wood, the fact that you needed pe people who don't actually know anything about construction at all can ping, pick it up pretty quickly. Uh, and then the kind of standardization of lumber um, within the Midwest. Here's a Chicago lumber yard from 1850 or 1860. Uh, stacking of lumber. Um, and, and then probably the single most uh, significant kind of act that proliferated this, uh, apart from all of the, the reasons why it was easy, was the, the kind of Homestead Act that was passed in the early part of the 19th century, which basically granted anybody who stuck out a plot of land at, 
through westward expansion and pledged to develop it with a with a house and live there for five years would get the land from the federal government. So the kind of advancement of the U.S. from east to west and, and the kind of occupation of the entire country uh, produced a real rapid uh, immigration uh, in that direction, but also required something that was easy to build. You couldn't be bringing stone and bricks uh, and heavy timber with you. So these things were were able to be built by by the families themselves uh, and and done pretty quickly. You know whether they were just little little huts, they just needed something on the land to prove they were on the land, covering it with tar uh, instead of actual siding. Um, but wood framing was something that everybody knew, even if it wasn't their trade. And it actually, these are actual settlers, <laughs> apparently. That was like the, the kind of caption on some of these photos. Um, some some pictures of, of lumber mill, but but so that kind of cemented it as something to, to do. Uh, it was, it, it became just the kind of landscape of what architecture looked like. It was easy, it moved quickly, it was light, it was super cheap uh, and you, didn't need to be good at it uh, for, for it to work, in part because it also ended up producing no superficial effects for the architecture itself. It always got surfaced with something else, whether, whether it was you know, tar or sod or siding, uh, it, it didn't matter. So it, it could look bad. And I think if any of, if any of you have toured softwood sites, there's always nails sticking through everywhere. There's always 700 nails where you would just need one good screw um, because, because it's so cheap. Uh, and so it, along with the kind of economic growth of the U.S. and the population growth, really provided a kind of like domestic landscape of things. This is housing built to relieve uh, people made homeless during the San Francisco earthquake. So its speed also, you know, like you could build an entire village of homes within a weekend. Um, and it, it kind of continued throughout, throughout the U.S. to what we get today. What I found interesting, and this is kind of uh, maybe not the general theme of what we're doing in the, in the exhibition, but maybe my just kind of particular interest is what this also is as a kind of reflection of our particular cultural priorities or our aesthetic priorities. Um, it, and when we started looking into the margins of wood framing, both its production, its history, you know, like even the patenting of the first hammer, um, you get to see things like, you know, what happens with forestry uh, and the kind of weird abstraction of our natural landscape that happens as we're trying to produce these kind of feral domestic landscapes through wood. So the kind of gridding of forests in Utah and South Dakota, uh, these kind of tree farms that start to produce these really strange land art exercises without any ambition to be uh, anything other than a tree farm. Uh, we've started to find really kind of interesting, the, the kind of taming of, of what's wild uh, in the pursuit of the kind of making wild what, what is typically tamed. Uh, and, and then even the kind of abstraction of, of architecture itself. So wood framing, because it's so light and, and kind of cheap again, like it's not, it, it's one of those things that like it works when everything's finally all together and it's utterly unstable until the project's complete. So you always have, like you can see in here, these kind of diagonal uh, temporary structures like flying buttresses just to kind of hold the walls up until all the walls are up and then it's rigid. Uh, there's no real sheer, you know, strength to the walls. So it relies on the sheathing. Originally that was done with boards and you have these kind of like diagonal boards. Then it was done with, with plywood. Uh, and then kind of quite, I don't know, maybe in, interestingly enough for us in the sixties, um, in California, this one individual arm in Elmendorf, uh, invented this material called oriented strand board, which is basically a kind of waste pulp byproduct that was pressed with glue uh, to replace plywood. And, and I guess it has no like soft spots because it's uniform, but it also starts to, to further abstract the kind of material origin of the project itself, where you're getting homes made of wood that no longer even have any kind of resemblance to the tree at which they came from you know like even in plywood you see the knots but here it just looks like felt 
uh, you know, or oatmeal uh, in a particular way. And you start to have, you know, so feathery uh, and, and they're kind of just weird, uh, I guess, I don't know, dissolution of, of anything with the resemblance to its origin seems to have also gone through our even idea of, of urban planning and, and the fact that kind of introduction of Levittown is this duplication of every, every building uh, being the same to kind of abstract the idea of the house and the community. These are photos of, of kind of movie sets that are put up, I, I don't know, maybe they're kind of out of sequence from where I was going with the rest of it, but just the, the kind of like artificiality of American culture that gets simulated within television and film, which is best produced through something cheap, which is, which is the kind of framing and scaffolding of things. But it all, I guess, comes down to what my interest in all of this is, is like it, like all of architecture is really just a kind of meditation or reflection on who we think we are. And it gets down to a kind of strange uh, issue of personality and the kind of embedding uh, what we do with who we are uh, and the kind of accoutrements or maybe the, I don't know, all, that, all the aspects of wood framing that have started to be personified and kind of anthropomorphized uh, into things, the kind of like use of it within cartoons. This one I found interesting just because uh, it uses the whole, like the frames of the cartoon as a way to track this kind of identity searching of these two characters as they go through this wood framed house under construction. So there's a, there's a lot of different types of framing simultaneously, which is some, something interesting. But we even, we even begin to use framing uh, as a way to kind of identify who we think we are or various versions of our kind of cultural psychology. This is Hacksaw Jim Duggan, who is an American pro wrestler in the 80s. We always see it as the kind of frustration of what the everyman can do. So Spike from Tom and Jerry building his doghouse. He's, he's obviously not a carpenter, but yet like, you know, wood framing is so kind of simple. And, and then even using the materials of construction as a way to, to construct horror, which has its own pathologies in, in American society. So, uh, you know, the, the chainsaw itself and to decorate our kids' digital lives. So since, since the pandemic, uh, we've really allowed our kids to play computer games. This is one called Sneaky Sasquatch, and there's a lumber yard as one of the, the things the Sasquatch has to do. So, um, But which, which is kind of getting me to wrap up about the, what, what all of this means. Uh, and this is maybe one of the things that I, this is an image of, of Snow White with makeup removed. Um, and I always found it kind of interesting because it ends up being maybe for me, one of the more subversive images I've seen in a number of years, which doesn't do much, but exposes so, you know, so deeply all of the kind of pathologies of at least American aesthetic and kind of political culture. Uh, and that, that shouldn't be in there, but it, it brings down to, I guess, the idea that for American framing in a way exposes these kind of superficialities through the fact that it's so utterly cheap. Uh, it's so common and ubiquitous and there's literally no way to do a better version of it. So every single two by four is the same two by four. Uh, there's no luxury one. The cheapest home is built with the same materials and the same techniques and just as poor detailing and just as sloppy nailing. Uh, and just as abstract OSB is the most expensive, expensive home. Um, and so they're, so in a way they're all the same and it's the kind of underlying structure that exposes the narcissism of all the crap that we end up spending our monies on to imagine ourselves as different uh, and kind of unique in individuals when in the end it's kind of the, the same. And, you know, I kind of have this tour of tracked homes and developer models from American suburbs. These are just the kind of promotional images that the developers show themselves to advertise the uniqueness and the kind of individuality of every finish that you can provide in different stones. But when you take them as a whole, uh, it all feels like e even whether you're in Arizona or Connecticut, uh, they all look the same. Uh, so that's my parents' house. So I always snuck 
that name. I think that's it. That is it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, uh, for this uh, very intriguing presentation, uh, uh, and which uh, really builds uh, an excitement for, you know, really imagining what you will do in the U uh, US pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Um, but I think uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, I, first of all, of course, if there are questions, uh, please come forward. Maybe I can start just with one mm -hmm. uh, simple question, which is uh, um, the way in which, uh, in a way, um, uh, I mean, how, how, you, how you actually uh, confront actually the, the work of uh, Gideon, who actually really saw in this uh, technique one of the major revolutions uh, in the uh, architectural, you know, building construction, but also building ethos mm -hmm. of the 19th uh, century. Um, because actually for him, actually the, 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 this technique was really a monument to ingenuity, to, you know, to this um, economy of means. So maybe there is also a kind of a Puritan kind of uh, uh, agenda behind, but you seem actually to, um, to, to offer a different perspective, uh, something that now has already been has already been done. I mean, there is, you know, it's, 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 it's actually a, 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 a building a, a technique that is already, has already produced a, an entire landscape. So I wonder what is actually, how your position as an architect, uh, you know, embrace this? I mean, you, you seems to be both excited, but also very, I mean, very sarcastic about it in, in a positive uh -huh. way. So I wonder how you, how you balance these two, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I always imagine myself as a kind of uh, op optimal cynic, um, optimistic cynic, in, in a sense. I, I, don't know, I find a, a lot of uh, things really loathsome within architecture and our built landscape. Uh, I, I guess, you know, I, I don't, I see it as a kind of innovative system the way kind of Gideon wrote about it, for, for me, what was interesting in the innovation had less to do with any type of like in integrity issues of it, but actually the fact that it was, it was a system that exploited an ability for relax, a relaxed sense of detailing and standards, right? Like uh, there's an enormous amount of float within, within the system. So you don't, have to be good at it to be good with it. And it, it was through that kind of uh, ease of entry that made it so useful at a time that America was expanding and building and growing uh, both people and, and buildings and the amount of land they were taking. So, so the, the innovation seemed really simple and kind of fascinating in the fact that it it found a way to make useful a tree that up until that time really had very little use other than as Christmas decoration um, for, for people or kind of seasonal, seasonal joy. Uh, and, and to me, that seems much more in, interesting as a kind of innovation to focus on because it's not a technical one or a kind of engineering one, but it's a right. kind of societal one, right? It's a kind of attitude yeah. uh, innovation that makes it a lot more pr yes. profound, I think, and, and kind of powerful in how it, how it goes. Um, you know, and it, and it is a, it's a, it makes it a kind of open source thing to use a kind of term, term of art uh, yeah. for how it, how it could be employed. Yeah, there are two questions in the chat. Uh, sure. One uh, is, could you expand on this? No, um, uh, I, uh, I, I also have a question. Oh. Yes. Shall, Gilly, want you want to ask a question first and then I will read the two questions in the chat. Gilly? No. Okay. So I will read the questions in the sure. in the chat. Uh, one question. Um, ah, Gilly? Yes, sorry. Um, hi. So my name is Gilly. I'm a PhD candidate with uh, Maria and Pierre Vittorio. And my uh, question, uh, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Okay. What I found really interesting was the sort of uh, modes of uh, representation that you showed us these uh, balloon frames and 
Uh, I've noticed that you've used a lot of uh, photography and also um, archival photography in the in the presentation. And mm -hmm. of course, this uh, the documentation of this kind of uh, construction was very common in the U.S., both in the 30s, but also in the 60s and 70s. And you started your presentation with the Beckers and you ended with this kind of very shiny kind of uh, brochure photography. And mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you think that kind of creating these... Uh, these typologies as a part of the American vernacular landscape. Yes, these images exactly. If this kind of idea of a vernacular America disseminated through photography contributed to the ubiquity, ubiquity of this method that you're describing, and if at all you think photography during this era had kind of, uh, with its own kind of conditions of mass production, um, has kind of contributed to the, to the system that you're describing here. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I haven't really thought about it in that way. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I would think not only because I, but I'm, I don't know how, how accessible was the photographic work that we're able to see today to everybody back then to have influenced, you know, that their, their understanding of, of things. Right. I mean, especially, I. It it originated in in the kind of metropolitan areas of the United States, but really, what made it stick was the fact that it became such a rural project. Right. So, a, and a as a, and a kind of isolated one. Um, so I I guess in that sense, I'm not quite sure how like, in, influential the the kind of meta documentation of the process at the time would have then fed back into the cultural adoption of it as a system anyway. Mm -hmm. But but I really don't know. I, it's a terrible answer to a good question that I just don't have an answer to, to I guess. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are two questions in the chat. One say, uh, could you expand on the Snow White picture? That's the first uh -huh. question. And the second question uh, is recently, Jean-Louis from uh, actually Philippe uh, Mesco, Recently, Jean-Louis Cohen has located the balloon frame as the sine qua non of Frank Gehry's work. Uh, since you mentioned your intention to make the normal weird, my question is rather open. How do you relate to uh, Gehry's work? Mm -hmm. Especially since uh, this Meg mentions utilize a kind of pastiche cladding, but uh, Gehry is not so interested in that. I, I think he refers, of course, to his uh, Gehry's early work. Right, yeah. Um... I don't know, to expand on the Snow White picture, so this was, uh, it, it's an, it was an editorial project from BuzzFeed um, where they just removed the makeup from Walt Disney characters, right? Like just to kind of, just to show how much our identity is, is a projection of the kind of superficialities of people, right? In a sense, because they all look, it, and I think the reaction that a lot of people had was that they're kind of horrifying instead of the other one, which is that this is who you are, right? Like, so, I don't know, I just, I always find it kind of, kind of interesting how much of the, of the kind of veneer is responsible for the aesthetic whole that, that we have. And then it just seems to fit wood framing in the sense that every wood framed house, like, you can't distinguish uh, one house from the next until its surfacing has been on it. They really look all the same because they're messy. There's just wood everywhere. It looks like the wild forests that have been turned into grids of forests um, when the projects are under construction. So they're kind of utterly indistinguishable until you finish it in a way, which is just to say that, that really the kind of uh, the identity should be the structure, not, not the finish. The one is the kind of vanity, the other is the kind of um, reality. Um, so, so that's that. And then I think, you know, I've obviously um, work like Gary's investigations uh, with his own house, right? I think it's largely like was based on his, his kind of ongoing project that he did with his own house where he would just build little additions here and there uh, and in part because like it was done out of wood framing because he could do it out of himself, right? Like he could afford it. It was easy to do. 
he could continue to do it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think we really identify or situate the, the curatorial project of the pavilion with any kind of single architect. And in fact, the whole point is that it's something that's not owned owned by anybody, even if they use it in a more expressive way. And the reality is Frank, I think, didn't even come up with the a formal language of his. He just refused to cover it in the kind of approved uh, finishing language of architecture. And that's what made it so remarkable. Yeah, there is one maybe last uh, quick uh, question. Mm -hmm. If balloon framing uh, is a societal innovation, is platform platform framing a societal innovation as well? No, no, I mean, I guess platform framing is is us uh, fixing the problems of social innovations, right? Like, because balloon framings are are really terrible because that second floor is kind of thinly attached to the walls. So plat platform framing is us getting smart, I guess. Yeah, Vittorio, can I add one thing? Yes, please. <laughs> Just out of, out of, given that this is a, a symposium on architectural um, history and theory. I guess one should be uh, sort of precise in certain things. Sure. And Frank Gehry, before becoming an architect, worked 15 years as a building developer, working with platform framing. So half of Santa Monica, not half of Santa Monica, a large number of buildings in Santa Monica were actually built by his firm, designed and built by his firm. So he was very, very familiar with that particular technology. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why he moved to, he moved on to his own buildings and was able to actually tweak that technology, making very important semantic um, transformations. But Frank Gehry was a building developer when he moved from Canada that used platform framing as a standard technology for many, many years. And he sustained his architectural practice out of his development work, just for the record. Yeah, and then I think he had like a, a kind of mental breakdown with that world and quit that and then started his his other thing. I, yeah. I mean, I guess to my point is like the, the, the wood framing for him isn't, wasn't a choice, right? Like, I, I guess that's what I mean is like, it, it's, <clears throat> it's ubiquity. It makes it the kind of uh, unconscious standard. So it's not a choice to work with wood framing. Well, I, well, personally, I would, um, I would, um, well, I would have a different interpretation. It's possibly the case with the uh, with the uh, with the bungalows for the artists outside mm -hmm. Malibu. But when one looks at his own bungalow in um, in um, in southern Santa Monica, in western Santa Monica, it's something that actually changes the detailing of of uh, of, uh, of uh, light timber framing. So the way in which he actually positions the timber within within the the envelope of the house requires a completely different approach to the fastening of the elements in his own house, whereas right. that's not the case right. with the earlier buildings. Right. So it's very, very conscious. It's actually done as an attempt to reconceptualize the same technology by using exactly the same elements, the same materials, but putting them together in a completely different way. That's right. And I, I agree with that. I meant like with, with the early work, the, the wood framing was just the default. And, yes. then, and then using it in his house was the default because for, for self-build things, like you have a little choice for the kind of like cultural contribution for him was realizing that there is a kind of beauty or at least a kind of uh, polemic within the rawness of its kind of in-progress state and to actually like make as the ambition that in-progress state to be the finished state. Um, for me, you know, I mean, when I look at that, I see like, I see a, a clean version of a house under construction. Well, it's, um, well, look, it's, uh, there will be a very long discussion, but okay. I, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's like the, the, the Bramantes Tempieto for the 20th century, <laughs> I think, for what it does to that technology. Anyway, it's uh, for just for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think we can we will resume these uh, discussions uh, later. Uh, meanwhile, Paul, thanks a lot. For Thank you very much. Really uh, interesting uh, uh, dive into into your research, which I think looks really really promising.